Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Webinar Wednesday. I am your host, Kieran Greening. So just to introduce myself, I am a safety advisor with the Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association. Without further ado, today's uh, session includes a special guest speaker. His name is Jason Wall with the LRWS. Um, so he's going to be going over some of the legislation changes that took place on April 1st to the OHS regulations in Saskatchewan. Jason, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure thing, Karen. Thanks for that. Uh, my name is Jason Wall. I am with LRWS, uh, specifically the Occupational Health and Safety Division. And um, in that division, we have several branches. It used to be uh, risk assessment and planning, but we renamed ourselves for divisional services. And my title within um, our uh, ministry is uh, the manager of um, standards and policy. So Part of my job, uh, I've been there about three years now. Part of my job is to uh, see how uh, we mesh standards with the regulations and um, among other things. So I think that, you know, it's fairly relevant to uh, today's topic. So I guess what I'll do is I'll get started on the presentation. So uh, Occupational Health and Safety Regulations 2020, long overdue. Uh, 1996 to 2020, that's uh, 24 years. That's quite a, quite a lengthy haul. Um, so just a couple quick points here. Uh, the government of Saskatchewan has made some amendments to the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations, okay? Um, there's always constant amendments, but this one was a fairly big one, especially with renumbering. And that's why we went to the 2020 um, name change. So effective April 1st, uh, it's now the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations 2020. They're in effect. Uh, a copy of these regulations can be found at Publication Saskatchewan, and there's a link there. Um, basically, any regulation um, act and so forth can be found through Publication Saskatchewan. So it's a very, uh, very good site. So some of the major changes here, um, a review was done um, essentially to do uh, harmonization. Um, harmonization is an initiative that was, uh, it's part of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement and it's to uh, break down barriers between territories and provinces and allow more free trading uh, within Canada. So we want to harmonize certain uh, personal protective equipment requirements within other jurisdictions in Canada. And uh, for this, we also made the change of the update to references, minor housekeeping amendments uh, to assist workers, employers and owners and contractors, okay? Just understanding their rights and obligations uh, a little more clearly. So with a summary of these changes, let's see, we have adopted several CSA standards. Um, one, the main one is for first aid kits. Uh, we harmonize personal protective equipment standards, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Consolidate three regulations. Again, this is just a broad overview. I'll get into a little more detail a little later on. Uh, we remove some seismic blasting exemption uh, to the uh, existing regulations. We renumber the regulations, which that was a, a biggie. And um, a few housekeeping, uh, cleaning up, uh, you know, for some wording and so forth. And then also added that special vaccination leave uh, uh, regarding COVID immunization. So harmonization. Um, this Canada-wide initiative to remove barriers to internal trade, um, I don't want to just read the slide, but essentially it's to help um, companies work within different provinces and have less um, hassle when it comes to, you know, we're focusing on personal protective equipment right now. So, um, you know, a company doesn't have to have a standard, say in Alberta, different one in Saskatchewan, different one in BC and so forth. This way, uh, the mobility between the provinces is, is a lot easier on the safety front. First aid, first aid risk assessment. All right. So with this new regulation, um, it requires an employer to have a first aid kit risk assessment done. Um, it's very important that this is done by a competent person and competent is defined actually in the uh, act itself. And, um, you know, this is someone that has um, uh, essentially knowledge, training, 
and um, that assessment will uh, determine the risk of the classification at the work site. Okay, so it's very important that um, it's done, uh, you know, for each different work site. You know, you might have one employer uh, that works at work site A and work site B. It might be the same uh, industry, it might even be the same number of employees, but depending on location and other activities, you know, uh, they may actually have different risk assessment classifications. Annex A of the CSA standard provides direction for undertaking this workplace first assessment, risk assessment. So um, personal protective equipment harmonization. Okay, so we've adopted many standards as approved. If uh, you notice in the regulations, there's a lot of uh, reference to the word approved standard. And approved standard, um, we'll get into the definition a little bit later, but essentially the, the list that we have here in front of us, um, these are standards that are approved and we didn't actually have to make a change to the regulations because it just cites an approved standard. So for industrial protective headwear, we have CSA Z94.1. Eye and face protectors, we have CSA 94.3. Protective footwear, CSA Z195. And hearing protection, Z94.2. And regarding personal flotation devices, um, as long as they're labeled approved by Transport Canada or another uh, maritime authority recognized by Transport Canada, they're acceptable. Uh, no regulatory amendments were required when adopting these standards, as I mentioned, because um, it's all under the guise of an approved standard. So um, various position, uh, provisions of the regulation refer to approved standards and practices and equipment. And here's where we define approved. And this is actually in the regulations. Um, approved by an agency acceptable to the director uh, for use in accordance with any terms and conditions that determined by the agency. So essentially, um, we define what we consider an approved standard. And uh, I'm actually getting a list together that I'm hoping will be put on our saskatchewan.ca website very soon. And that list will actually um, elaborate on some of those approved standards uh, for different aspects of, uh, or according to different sections of the regulation. So look for that soon. Um, it's also approved by a certificate of the director subject to any terms and conditions the director imposes. So essentially, again, we define approved. And if there is um, something that say that's not on an approved list that an employer you know, would like to find out if this is an approved standard, they're welcome to call uh, Occupation Health and Safety and um, make that inquiry. So um, adoption of these standards will ensure consistent equipment and practices across jurisdictions. Uh, this will in turn enhance health and safety. Um, it's also intended to improve labor mobility uh, by reducing costs, administration for workers and businesses operating across the jurisdictions. Okay, so we can access um, these harmonized standards for free through the CSA website. Now, I'm gonna go through a little demonstration later on and uh, physically demonstrate how this is done. Um, essentially, these seven steps are a, a quick guide in how to access this. And again, uh, it's fairly easy to do, it's free, and I'm not gonna read all these uh, points because I'll do a demonstration, it's very easy to find. There's actually two methods, one through the CSA group store and there's another one through CSA communities, essentially giving you the same information. So the consolidation of regulations, there were three that we actually put together. Uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations 1996, the Occupational Health and Safety Prime Contractor Regulations, and the Occupational Health and Safety Workplace Hazardous Materials Information System Regulations, WIMIS. So we consolidated these to reduce the confusion um, increase ease of reference for workplace parties in order to support compliance. So yes, now everything is in one handy in one handy place. Um, now this is an, an area that's fairly interesting. Um, we always had an exemption for seismic 
um, exploration and blasting um, where we would refer to um, a different ministry and a different uh, set of regulations and, and legislation. However, uh, now this legislation now falls under the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations 2020. So we've removed that um, exemption. So you can, uh, the section was formally 375. We renumbered the regulations. This was uh, a big change and it actually took a lot of work, especially with uh, some of the guides that say uh, WorkSafe um, Saskatchewan have put out. Um, a lot of employers, um, I'm sure that even the SCSA, I, I believe they had a uh, an app that um, would have had to, has to be updated. So this change in the numbering um, was very intensive. Uh, the reason we did this change, it allows uh, easier use, um, believe it or not, it will become easier and it's easier to uh, make changes in the future, accommodate future amendments and, um, and so forth. So uh, it's more of a long-term um, advantage. Housekeeping amendments. Uh, general housekeeping amendments have been made to, um, in order to update references to repeal legislation, such as the Occupation, Occupational Health and Safety Act in 1993, uh, modernize some of the language to reflect current practices, such as using general ne neutral language. Uh, we also included in the uh, regulations the special vaccination leave. So effective March 18th, uh, workers are entitled to a minimum of three consecutive hours of paid leave during work hours to obtain a COVID vaccination. Um, they are entitled to more than three consecutive hours paid leave um, if their employer determines that that circumstance is warranted. And this can be found in section 6.22-6-22.1. Uh, so more information um, can be found at uh, either our Occupational Health and Safety Division, uh, the numbers listed on the screen there. Uh, you can find a lot of information on the saskatchewan.ca website, worksafe.ca website, and publication saskatchewan.ca. So that sort of concludes the very brief presentation. So this is going to be a quick demonstration on how to access um, the standard, the CSA standard. And many, act, many standards are actually free for Canadians and can be accessed this way. Uh, not all, and I know CSA has told me that they are working on, um, you know, hopefully getting every standard they have as free access. Um, you know, and again, this access is fairly limited. You know, you can only view, um, you can't print or download, but uh, at least it's an easy way to find out what's in, this, what's in these standards. So if a person just searches for uh, the CSA store, you'll see a list. And as long as you go to uh, CSA uh, store, uh, either one, and of course, that's not the one I want. Okay, here we are. And if you look at the top of the screen, um, if you've never logged in before, you can go to, there's a login and register up in the top right hand corner. So if a person clicks on that, and I've already registered a um, generic account just to, for this demonstration. So one step will sort of be missing here, but we'll work through it. So if you don't have an account, you would say create an account, okay? Um, put your first name, last name, country. Um, you can put your industry and job title if you want. It's not necessary. It's important to have an email and then you choose a password for the CSA site. Now I'll just go back because I've already done this and like anything else, when you register, you always get a, um, you need a confirmation email. So for example, this fictitious account, uh, this was sent to the CSA uh, group account. Um, I call myself Joe Canadian. And this is where it tells you a little bit about the free account that you made. 
but you don't actually have to verify it through this website or through this uh, email. You it, just some information for your uh, for your um, benefit. So once you're registered, you put your email in the uh, username, password, log in. I'm not going too fast in my care. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and we are waiting. Otherwise, I think I'm going to demonstrate um, how to access the regulations through publication Saskatchewan. So maybe I'll start doing that right now while that's refreshing. Hopefully well, that'll come back. So we search for publications fast. Okay. Now, here is where you can look for popular documents, uh, anything that you want. You can browse by type, uh, you can browse by government agency, you can, um, you can browse by uh, if you want to look for uh, legislation specifically, acts. Um, Pardon the dog in the background if you can hear that. Sorry about that. Uh, you can look for acts. You can look for uh, regulations here. But we're going to do something a little more simple. And we're going to actually do just a search right here. And we're going to search for Let's see what we get. Okay, so right here, Occupational Health and Safety Regulations 2020. Okay, so uh, this site is where you access it. You want to download the uh, regulations for free. There's a PDF right here. You can click on it. And there we go, populates the screen. So um, the advantage of PDF um, is it's very easy to search for information that you want. Um, I, I prefer it rather than a hard copy. I know some people are more old fashioned and I believe uh, through that website, you can um, order, in, uh, order hard copies. Um, but again, I'm not that familiar with the method for doing that. Anyhow, so that's how you can access the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations. You can, you can also ac access other related topics. So for example, the Saskatchewan Employment Act um, uh, and so forth. So, you know, that's a, a fairly easy way to access the uh, information. Okay, let's see if the CSA is back up. And it looks like I'm actually logged in. Kind of missed a step there. I'm going to log out. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. I just want to go through this process very easily. So, in my account. We put our username, password, log in, and here we go. So once you're here, you can basically search for any standard you want. So in this case, it would be Z1220. Uh, it pops down on the menu. Uh, probably if there's more than one version, uh, maybe an older version or something or a similar version, um, you'd see more than one item here, but in this case, it's pretty straightforward. You click it, search. And you're going to get several options here. Um, here's where you can actually have a chance if you want to purchase the standard, or there's other ways that you can subscribe. Um, and it allows access to these standards for a varying number of people. Um, in different locations. But again, all this is dependent on copyright, as, uh, as you can see. 
what we'll do is we'll just highlight the, the uh, title name, um, standard name. And once this populates, you'll see if it's a free view, you'll see this view access here, kind of mid page on the left. If the standard does not have free view access, this will not appear. Um, in this case, the standard is free to view. We will click that. And for some reason, it's telling me I wasn't logged in. But it looks like it's working. I have some uh, Jeopardy music playing while this is happening. <laughs> Hmm. Wow. Just when it gets to the good stuff, it likes to. Yes, exactly. Okay, here we go. Now the web viewer is coming up. Okay, so this is what should happen. Um, you have uh, the whole standard at your fingertips here. You can change the size. You can scroll uh, by page, pick a page, and so forth. Uh, the only thing that's a little more difficult is searching. Um, it doesn't, you can't really search like you can with a PDF file, which is unfortunate. But again, if you need uh, that sort of detail, it's better to just purchase the standard. Um, from what I can tell, the standard here, it's $100 Canadian, um, but that's again, a single user license. And I don't wanna get into the licensing aspects of the standards. It's like any other published work, right? There, there are certain copyright uh, rules behind it. And I believe um, there might be some questions related to, you know, how to uh, look at this information and make it available, um, you know, on an ongoing basis. And I think I might have an answer for you uh, coming up. So we'll just close that. And um, I guess the other uh, other option I was going to show is if a person goes in to uh, find the standard, you can go in through CSA communities. Um, now this probably won't work because I haven't registered, but what I'm gonna do, okay, I'll, I'll just use mine, it's okay. You can't see my password, so I think I'm good. All right, so um, when it comes to CSA uh, communities, um, the one thing that you can do is you can search for standards. Um, you can search for standards view access. And occupational health and safety. Now, this CSA site, the one advantage of this is that if there is any uh, regulation or any, uh, sorry, standard that is referenced in the legislation, you can find it at this page. So for Saskatchewan, there isn't very many uh, regulations cited specifically uh, because we use that term approved standard, but in a few places they are. So for example, if we, uh, we have occupational uh, safety diving uh, code for diving operations, um, you can view it or buy it. And, and again, you can view for free, but this is an old standard. Um, another way, let me just go back here. Another way that you can look at any harmonized standard, if you look on the very far right-hand side, uh, French is first, but if you look past there, the um, English versions are, are lower. So you can actually have free access to the protective footwear, industrial protective headwear, eye and face, first aid kits and hearing. And any of these standards can be accessed this way, the same way they can be accessed through the CSA store. So um, this allows, again, this is a view access portal, not quite as eloquent as the um, uh, CSA store application, but basically the same, same thing, so. Anyway, that sort of concludes the uh, quick demonstration on how to access the information. So um, is there, uh, there must be some questions.
There are. So we've got some questions in the, the Q&A feature down below, but we've also got some questions from um, some members of the construction industry around Saskatchewan. So I'll start with those questions and then we'll get to the ones that are in the question and answers. So the first question I've got here is, um, will there be an addition to the regulations that takes into account the distance from a medical facility? So I'm assuming that's on that hazard assessment. Right, you're very correct. So uh, simply put, no, there won't be any uh, addition to the regulations. And um, the distance from a medical facility, it's an important consideration for that first aid risk assessment. So again, that's, that's where it's encompassed in doing that risk assessment. And again, that can be found in the CSA standard uh, under Annex A. Excellent. So the next question I've got is, it relates back to that hazard assessment. So what are some situations where a construction project or company could be considered low risk, medium risk um, by, this, by the standard? So the low risk means uh, activities with a small likelihood of the occurrence of harm and low severity of that harm being predominant. Right. And, and looking at that question, um, I mean, it, it, it seems like that question is specifically asked about the construction, uh, a construction project. So, but in general, um, I don't want to make speculations because there are so many factors at play with this sort of determination, right? Um, there are so many considerations for uh, the workplace first aid risk assessment. They're all found in Annex uh, A of that standard, uh, specifically Clause A.2. Um, this a couple of the highlighted points of this that should cover that um, aspect are sort of characteristics of the workplace, right? So not only what type of work are you doing, um, what kind of equipment is around and so forth, um, what industry sector trends are, right? And even uh, what is the organization's safety record? So, you know, one organization that is exemplary in safety, um, which has an identical, uh, I'll say, factor as far as the industry, number of employees, with another uh, employer that maybe isn't um, is struggling a little bit with, with their safety record. Um, I mean, that would play a factor in how this information is determined, right? So it's, so it's really hard to give a specific example of that. Um, but I, I can say that it, it would be fairly rare in my estimation that a construction project would ever be labeled a low risk. But again, there may be factors as long as this risk, risk assessment is done by a competent person. So for sure. To the question. Yeah. So I got some more questions. Um, for what for places that have two workers working together, there's a requirement for a class A attendant. What happens if the class A attendant gets hurt or potentially leaves the company? and the other worker has to attend to an injured. Um, so would this be contravening the legislation or is there something else in there for that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question, it's a fair question. I mean, it's unfortunate, you know, scenarios like this could happen, right? Um, it, it could potentially happen at any time. But I mean, in that specific case, uh, my interpretation of the regulation is that regardless uh, there was a class A attendant, he may have been injured, but technically the legislation was not uh, contravened in that case, right? So um, no, you wouldn't have to have two people trained. Um, again, you could have, you know, you could have every one of the employees injured, which is a, would be a terrible scenario, but I mean, you can't cover all, you know, every possible scenario. So as long as an employer is making every effort to meet the regulations and the legislation, I think that would all be uh, taken into account. For sure. Um, so next question here, will there be any guidance put out by OHNS or WCB defining a level of risk for each industry like WorkSafe BC has that is used as an example in the CSA standard? Now I know that question kind of goes back <laughs> on, on the hazard assessment, but if you will. Yeah. Um, not specifically at this time, uh, to my knowledge, uh, we're not developing anything. But I mean, that's definitely something uh, for future, um, uh, you know, for future work. So for sure. Yeah. 
So um, next question with class B training, including some criteria slash components that are not typically associated with construction sites, could it be possible to have a class B training amended to be more applicable to actual job sites? The amount of training required by a class B attendant is well beyond the amount of training that would be used on a job site with, uh, within a, that is within a close proximity of medical services. Right, well, and again, this takes into account um, the risk assessment, right? If you are that close to a medical facility, you may be a lower risk and you may not need that class B. So, I mean, th those factors all come into play, um, but not at this time um, are we contemplating changing uh, the regulations specifically for that. Uh, but I will mention that there is some work being done uh, to incorporate the other similar CSA standard, uh, CSA Z1210, uh, first aid training for the workplace. And we are looking at um, adopting that standard as well. Uh, it's on the agenda for harmonization uh, through Canada. And I'm not exactly sure of the timeline just yet, but that's definitely on the, on the books for, for review. So um, I guess really to answer that, we wouldn't make amendments to the regulations um, when we we're gonna be adopting the standard, which, you know, which would, basically cover that scenario. Okay. Um, so this, this question kind of piggybacks off of that one, I think a little bit. So uh, class B training, there's very few offerings across the province, no more than a few times a year. Um, in order to take that class, you must take first aid class, which is the, the prerequisite. And then there's a two week class B training program. So if a company has class B attendant and they quit their job, is there some sort of grace period if if that job site has is is ranked high risk or do they have to immediately have a new class B worker on site? Right. Um, well, well, there's no official grace period. Um, I am confident that if an employer can demonstrate in good faith that they're making you know every effort to comply with the legislation, um, any occupational health and safety officer would take this under consideration. So you know scenarios happen um and again it, it all boils down to what's the intent what what are people trying to achieve here like we want people we want workers to be safe so you know uh situations happen all all the time um are these situations actually being monitored and are they um you know, how seriously is the employer taking this information or this situation? You know, all that's a factor. So, you know, as a general rule, I can definitely say that, you know, um, if, if somebody is acting in good faith, I don't see um, issues with regard to how an officer would um, interact with them as far as uh, is that. Okay, perfect. Um, so this kind of, this question kind of, pulls away from the, just the first aid. Um, so what is the enforcement period where the OHNS officers will start giving contraventions for failing to meet these regulations? Um, so in essence, will there be a transition or in other words, a grace period? Well, again, uh, I'm not aware of an official grace period, um, but it does realize that, you know, the employers, there has to be some flexibility in order for them, uh, the employer, to meet the expectations of these amended regulations. So um, it's all really situation dependent. You know, can the employer demonstrate that they're making efforts to comply? If they can, you know, again, it, it's a very similar answer to the previous question. Yeah, and, and to piggyback off of that, um, so SCSA will be giving a six month grace period for companies that are changing their legislation for the core program. Um, but we're ultimately going to align with LRWS if an official grace period does come out. So in the next few months, we'll find that information out. But if you have a core audit coming up, um, not that you shouldn't start, but reasonable um, actions will be rewarded with, with points in the audit. So um, to get out of that, we'll go into the next question. So there's a table in, in the, the regulations table eight that, that defines construction as a high hazard. Does this trump a hazard <laughs> assessment in any way? No. Uh, unfortunately, the inclusion of table eight in the regulations was an oversight. Um, 
the risk assessment level is solely dependent on the assessment performed by a competent person. So essentially table eight was inadvertently left in from the previous regs. And if there is a small minor housekeeping amendment regu um, uh, review at some point, that will be removed. So table eight really is uh, not applicable at this time. Okay. Um, so our next question, if a company has 27 workers on site, but decides the risk is moderate, so that competent person uses the risk assessment tool and they define that it's moderate and they don't require a class B attendant and a serious injury occurs, will they be held accountable to table nine's requirement if it, if it was determined by an officer that it should have been a high hazard? Okay, um, well, okay, so if a risk assessment was done, as you mentioned, um, you know, my, it, my opinion is, I'll give you my opinion, but I'm, I don't have a background in law, so I'm not the, maybe the best person to ask, but, you know, if they consider all the factors and it's done by a competent person, um, I don't see that there would be an issue because it was, again, it was done in good faith and so forth. But I mean, if you do a risk assessment and it's bordering between say a moderate and a high risk, why not err on the side of caution on the side of safety, right? Um, if, you know, if it, again, you know, it, it rather play fast and loose, it's easier to say, yep, yeah, you know, this could become high risk, even though maybe right now it's moderate, let's take no chances and go for it. But again, if it's a very clear moderate risk or it was assessed that way and it's documented that way, I don't see an issue. Again, it'd be best to get the advice from a lawyer, but that's my <laughs> humble opinion. <laughs> Certainly. Um, so the last question I have from the, the questions from previous, um, information found on that CSA website cannot be shared like we discussed, printed, downloaded, et cetera. Um, how can construction sites with little to no cell coverage, um, Wi-Fi access, access these um, the standards if, if they're required? That's a, I mean, that's a very fair question. Um, there, there are a couple different options, right? Uh, obviously users, you know, ideally should abide by all copyright laws. Um, and there are certain things. So if, if a person purchases the standard, you can always have one hard copy that anybody can view at any time, you know, that gets around the Wi-Fi issue. But another, uh, another way to handle this would be for an employer to develop their own policies or procedures. And those uh, policies or procedures sort of mimic the standard, essentially have the same information in there. And it's their policy, their procedure, they can print it or view it or do whatever they want. So the information, um, you know, you're not stealing the information if you determine that your policy or procedure is going to, again, mimic what's in CSA, right? So that's one way to get around that. Sure. So one question I have about the, the first aid kits and the risk assessments. So if I'm a smaller company and I have, let's say service calls, would I be able to do a blanket risk assessment for service calls or do I need to do a specific risk assessment for individual sites? Well, that's a very, it's a good question. And I think, it, you know, it's, if you did a risk assessment and you looked at all the factors and your general sites uh, were always gonna be say the same industry, the same um, hazard, aspects, right? There's so many factors to consider in table, uh, uh, I should say, in uh, Annex uh, A of the standard. But if you looked at that and did a risk assessment and, you know, maybe pick a couple of the different scenarios, you know, worst case, best case, and see what you get, um, you know, you could do a blanket risk assessment. But again, the only, the only issue with that is you don't really know what circumstances, you know, location A might be right next to a medical facility, whereas location B could be extremely isolated, right? So um, your, the nature of your work may not change as, as an employer, but the nature of the site you're going to or who you're encountering or the equipment that's there, you know, all these things do play a factor. So, um, you know, a person could maybe do a few different risk assessments, again, based on various scenarios, 
And then knowing where they're going to go, they could assign um, these sites to those risk assessments. So yeah, it, it's hard to do a blanket scenario, but um, it is possible. For sure. So within that regulation, it, it states that the CSA standard is, is what the law is. So within the standard, we see normative, which means we must do it to comply with the standard, and we see informative. So Annex A, like you're talking about, is technically informative within the standard, but the OHNS regulations state that the, um, the risk assessment is mandatory. So is that a regulation that, that it is mandatory? Uh, yes, um, you're, very, you're very correct on that. Um, if you were going by the CSA standard alone, and you didn't have um, jurisdictional influence, uh, you could say um, that table or that annex is an informatory, uh, informative tool. Um, however, if you are in Saskatchewan, um, our regulations state that you, you must use uh, Annex A. Now, if you used ab something above and beyond Annex A and at least had those factors in there, um, th there's nothing wrong with that either. But as long as it follows the guidelines of Annex A and there's, uh, you know, all those factors are considered, you know, that that is the the law, and uh, we you know have to do that. Um, but for another, I'll just throw something else out there. CSA does have a risk assessment uh, and hazard analysis. Uh, type of standard. Um, I haven't done a comparison to see how it compares with Annex A. It's probably uh, well above and beyond that, the scope of that. So um, I'm not going to say yes, if you follow that standard, you're okay. But as long as uh, a person does their uh, due diligence and looks into that, um, I don't think there'd be an issue. Again, as long as, as long as someone follows the steps or the um, factors considered in Annex A, there shouldn't be an issue. Excellent. So to do with the risk assessment, I've got a question here. Who is deemed competent to perform first aid assessments and what are the core competencies that might be required? That's a really good question. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that specifically. Um, right. So. Uh, Competent means, means possessing knowledge, skills, and experience, right? So, um, you know, it might take more than one person to do a proper risk assessment, depending on the scenario, right? Um, each industry, each employer, they have specific information that uh, is related to them. So, for example, I talked about the um, accident history or performance. Um, of that company, that's a factor. And, you know, only they would know about that in their industry. Now, you could definitely have someone come in, uh, some safety expert come in and work with you, but they wouldn't necessarily have all that knowledge unless you provide them the information, right? So, again, you know, I can't give you a blanket statement um, as far as what is considered competent other than you know, uh, if someone is has knowledge, uh, training and experience within that industry and um, has knowledge of safety, uh, they should be able to perform the risk assessment. But again, uh, it would be very dependent on each situation. So I don't know if that's really a, a specific answer to that question, but uh, it's all I can give you for the moment. For sure. Um, so I think the next couple of, the couple of questions that overlap here, um, Person Pierce is asking, uh, may I ask when copies of the newly numbered regulations are available? They're available currently on the website, the publications government website that uh, Jason just showed us. Get rid of that one there. Um, so although distance is a consideration on the risk assessment, the definitions of severity and consequence um, in parentheses, level of incident, do not include any reference of distance to a medical facility. So I'm not sure that's a question so much as a statement, but um, how would you determine your 
distance to a medical facility with, to do with risk? Um, okay, so I guess it's the mode of transportation as well, right? Um, you may be far enough away um, as far as, uh, you know, bird's eye view type of distance, but if you have um, access to ambulance or other uh, modes of transportation that can get you to a medical facility, you know, that's, that's the key. I mean, you could be um, in a large city and far enough away, and if there's always problematic traffic, uh, your that time is more critical than necessarily distance, right? It's the mm -hmm. it's the time to uh, that medical facility. So, um, you know, again, all those things have to be considered. You know, and it's always better uh, to err on the side of caution, right? Oh yeah, you know, maybe it's only a, a ten minute drive to get someone to the hospital, but if there's heavy traffic uh, on occasion and that doubles in time. It's better to use that as the uh, the factor in in determination. So using using good judgment with exactly. with the risk assessment paired, right? As long right. as it's reasonable. And that's right, and that's where it comes down to someone that's competent. You know, you don't want to skirt around um, the issues where you know, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a ten minute drive. You know, uh, let's be a little more thorough. Let's let's look at the you know what could happen scenarios right and you know if, if you're competent and you're doing a proper risk assessment you will consider all those factors right mm -hmm. absolutely so our next question is do we need to replace our first aid kit or can we only add the missing item sorry i just read it wrong there um <laughs> i know exactly where you're going with this um so basically you're saying can you just uh add or um, change the kit that you have to meet or be compliant. Of course, of course. Yeah, you don't have to go out and purchase a brand new kit. You might be able to find the supplies you need a lot cheaper in bulk if you uh, maybe your larger employer and you know you only have to add uh, X, Y, and Z instead of you know the whole kit. Mm -hmm. By all means, you know, purchase it in bulk and, and make your changes. For sure. Um, so here's a longer winded question here. Um, because the new first aid risk assessment standard was linked to table nine, it's a significant change to industry. Previously high risk sites were within a specified distance from medical facility did not need a paramedic level attendant. Um, I think they're referring to the class B attendant. So under these revised regulations, high risk sites with more than 40 workers now require a licensed paramedic. I'm not sure if that's regardless of their proximity to a medical facility, this is a very significant change. So I think that question stuck on that other table stating that all construction sites are high risk. Right, and that that's right. And that's where we basically ignore table eight <laughs> in the current <laughs> regulations. Um, so does Annex A provide a standardized risk assessment format for use by employers? I don't think it does. Um, I know that Annex B actually, even though it's not uh, written in the regulations as part of the standard, Annex B does have an example. And that is actually based on, I believe it's actually based on some information from WorkSafe BC. Um, but it's again, it's a general guideline, right? Um, I'm sure that there are numerous um, risk assessment formats and templates out there. Uh, I, you know, as long as, again, these factors are considered uh, that are listed in uh, Annex A, um, it shouldn't be an issue. For sure. And the second part of that question, is there a standardized format elsewhere? So we did, uh, the SCSA created a fillable PDF version of a, of a hazard assessment for this, or pardon me, a risk assessment. Um, if it's not on the website now, it should be shortly, so you'll be able to access it there. That's excellent. Yes. looking through these questions. So this person is asking their anonymous attendee, do you know when the new combined manual will be available in print format for me to order? Um, I believe it's available now. Um, I can't speak for sure to that fact. Although I am under the impression though that it is now two separate documents. Because the regulations have uh, combined 
the original version and the prime contractor and Wemis. Um, it's a bit bigger. And I think that uh, they've separated the two now. So it's not necessarily one doc. It's not available as one document. Again, don't quote me on that, but that's my understanding. Okay. So this person here um, said, how could we cite the acts and regulations since the numbering systems are now almost identical? Hmm. Well, I see, I think I see the question. It's relating to if you cite a, an act or a reg, um, how do you know which one? I guess as long as you're citing the fact that you're stipulating this is in the act and this is in the regs, that's, um, that's the only way you can do it. And again, you know, if you're citing something specifically, I know that there is, um, there's nothing that, you know, I'm going to say that it has to be a, a, a legal requirement. There is standards for that. Like it depends on uh, what you're citing it for. Are you just talking with someone? You know, and you can also, I guess, as a another idea, you can cite the the head, the header, the headline, the title of the uh, of the clause or of the section. So, and some, yeah, it is similar, and I think that's part of the reason they wanted to do that. Um, again, the act was done that way because it's easier to amend and make changes. And the regs were just behind the eight ball on that. And now we've, we've caught up. Sure. Um, looking through my questions, some of these have been answered. A couple of them are just referring to that, um, the CSA standard just person had to struggle with viewing all of the pages. Um, so that standard, I believe, has 31 pages. So as long as it has those pages, um, if not, try the other the other route and see if you can get the extra pages that it's missing. Because, yeah, the information on the CSA website is, is, is current. So unless you're having an actual maybe glitch with your connection or something else, it should all should all show up. For sure. Um, this person asks, will there be a charge to have a printed version of the manual? The manual meaning? Or, or, uh, pardon me, uh, the manual um, of the regulations and the act. Um, I believe they do charge for that. But again, I, I can't speak specifically um, on that fact. That would be under um, Publication Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And and there's always there's always the option to print the PDF as well. Exactly, you're welcome to do that. And uh, again, there that's obviously cost when you're you know, when you're inking paper. But you know if that's an easier method to do, so be it. Okay, so I got a question here from Barb regarding the special vaccination leave. Um, so if an employee is able to receive a vaccination after working hours, say the clinic is open till 10 p.m., does the employer still have to pay for those three hours? if they receive it after those normal working hours? Okay, so I'm not an expert in this aspect of the regulation, so I wanna be careful of what I say. Um, my understanding is that the worker has to request the access or the, uh, the leave from their employer. The, um, it's not just taken for granted. If an employee wants to have access to this, they must coordinate with their employer on how to do that. Um, and in that case, again, I think it's best to call uh, maybe employment standards to find out more details on those specific issues. Um, I'd rather not speculate on that. Excuse me. So <laughs> I've got a question here. Um, I'm going to kind of reword it. So this person's asking for a comment on the fact that not potentially not a fact. Um, was there industry consultation on these changes? And if there wasn't, how come? Uh, there was industry consultation. Um, I, I don't have uh, at my fingertips the actual dates, but uh, this was done um, through consultation, I believe, I'll say about a year ago. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but industry was consulted on, on, on these changes. And um, yeah. Yeah, and I imagine it's just a case of we can't consult with everybody, so. Right. 
Um, I, I mean, I, if I remember correctly, I think information was put up uh, on the Gazette, you know, um, as far as how consultation is done. Again, that's a, a different department than, than my own, but um, yeah, I, I definitely know that it was, it was done in a proper fashion. Perfect. And the last question that seems to be um, a few of the questions here. So will we be able to get a copy of the slideshow presentation that you had prepared for this? I don't see why not, for sure. Sure. So um, just have people reach out to their advisors and to the SCSA and I can forward right. the presentation to, to the people who are interested in, in having sure. it. I'll make sure you get a copy. Wonderful. So that kind of brings us to the end of our hour. I want to thank Jason for, for coming on the webinar, doing such a great job answering our questions with, uh, with the broad view of, of all the things that have changed with the regulations. So um, thanks for tuning in for this edition of the Wednesday webinar. And thanks again, Jason. No problem. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks.